Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bjork of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a first time guest, but he actually runs the top nuclear power and uranium investing website. And I'm really interested to hear his thoughts on nuclear power, uranium, because it seems like it's going to be a long term solution for our cheap electricity problem. And actually, it's a more efficient way for energy and electricity. Justin Yoon, thank you for joining me. It's my pleasure. Glad to be here, Jason. Thanks for having me. So, Justin, uh, the uranium spot price, we're recording this interview on Friday, January 27th, 2023. The uranium spot price, I think, is a little bit below $50. The long-term contract price is a little above $50. So it's substantially higher than it was 12, 18 months ago. But what do you think are the major demand drivers for uranium and nuclear power going forward? Uh, we actually the, the spot price caught a little bit of a bid today. Actually, uh, we're a bit of, I bet we're close to fifty one dollars a pound here, but um, that primarily had to do with seeing some capital flows into the spot uh, physical uranium trust and and the prospect of buying pounds. They might have been buying a little bit today, actually, but um, the spot price is is not really reflective of the primary uh, market where nuclear fuel utilities. Uh, or nuclear power plant utilities source their fuel for the reactors. So that's typically the long-term contracting market. Um, and the primary drivers really for this market right now have to do with not only the uh, the life extensions that are being granted to um, reactors around the world. And of course, we do have some premature closures we can talk about. But for the most part, nuclear is getting sort of re-embraced as, as vital, you know, clean baseload energy. Um, and so we have not only just life extensions for existing reactors, but there's uh, currently 60 reactors under construction globally. 22 of those 60 are in China. Um, and globally, these numbers are quite large. 112 reactors are being planned. And there's over 300 that are currently proposed on a global basis. So it's a sector that a lot of people have sort of forgotten about over the past decade, especially post Fukushima Daiichi accident in 2011. But the sector has continued to grow and the prospects for it going out into the end of the decade, into the 2030s are are quite good. Yeah, I've been following uranium and nuclear power for over a decade. I'm friends with Rick Rule. I was invested in uranium companies prior to Fukushima and then Fukushima happened. It looked like there was going to be a bull market prior to Fukushima and then Fukushima also set, I would say, the industry back many years. I had an off-the-record conversation with someone who was working at nuclear power plants here in my area, and he was just telling me how negative the sentimentality was by politicians and potential investors. But it seems in this environment, Justin, where energy prices and electricity prices and diesel prices can go bonkers, or you have uh, the supply chain problem, so there's just not supply or energy prices can spike. Nuclear seems like a really smart long-term solution if you're Germany, Japan, China, some of these major manufacturing powerhouses, and you want a cheap, stable source of a baseload electricity, like you said, rather than worrying that natural gas prices, now they're below the cost of production when we're recording this, but only two months ago, they were at seven or eight, and the LNG prices in Europe to import liquefied natural gas were astronomically high. Yeah, it's uh, definitely the rising cost of energy over the past 12 to 18 months have put a, uh, a highlight on the uh, on the importance of nuclear and importance of baseload. Um, you know, nuclear has so many advantages in these particular situations. And in some cases, obviously, depending on on the reactor design, the jurisdiction in which it was built, the sunk costs, et cetera, the lifespan of the reactor can affect the overall operational costs and therefore the cost of energy being produced by that plant. But generally speaking, it's on the lower end of the cost curve. But there's other elements that are equally, if not more important, that not just that's not just related to the actual cost of the energy they're producing. That has to do with, you know, national security. I mean, looking exactly, Germany is just. Uh, I mean, it's it's really kind of the poster poster child of of what not to do in terms of energy policy, and it's despite the fact that um, they're polluting more than ever. And the energy costs, uh, the energy costs in the country are are uh, exceedingly high. Industry is leaving the country because of that. In my opinion, this is honestly kind of a positive story because it's a great example of what not to do. And everybody is watching this. So, just to put some numbers out there and put this whole situation in context for Germany, Germany had 17 nuclear reactors operating prior to the Fukushima Daiichi accident. After which, they decided to phase out nuclear by 2020, uh, 2022. They do still have three reactors remaining online. We're increasingly um, believing that those might remain online further. They're supposed to be shut down in April of this year. But following Fukushima, they decided to phase it out. They shut down about half of their fleet in relatively short order and continued to phase out as the year has progressed. 
In the wake of that nuclear phase-out plan, they invested over $500 billion into a program called the Energy Vendi Program, where they essentially put uh, the bulk of these funds into expanding their renewable energy fleets, so their wind and solar especially, but also biomass. And of course, biomass in Germany is you know, trees being cut down in North America and shipped across the ocean to be burned uh, to, to boil water and, and turn a turbine. Um, absolutely absurd to call that green energy, but uh, that's where we are in terms of this ideologically driven policy. So Germany spent half a billion on energy vending, and it essentially was an abject failure. They are polluting more carbon into the atmosphere than they ever have, uh, and that is a direct result of them shutting down their nuclear reactors and having to re- having to rely on both coal and natural gas because the renewables just aren't cutting it in the country of Germany. For example, their solar uh, their solar fleet in Germany, on average, solar uh, uh, photovoltaic solar panels run at about eleven percent capacity factor. That means eleven percent of the time they're actually producing um, electricity. That's and, inefficient. Or, Sounds inefficient. <laughs> extremely, extremely. And so that's obviously on a sunny day, probably in the summertime, when the sun is more uh, directly overhead. So that doesn't even take into into uh, account, you know, the the big costs of those sources being buffered. And what do I mean by that? These are intermittent sources. So when the wind isn't blowing, when the sun isn't shining, you have to have either grid scale battery backup, or in this case, in Germany's case, coal backup. So bring us to tw- the winter of 2022, 2023. Germany spent another $500 billion just to get through this winter because they had insufficient natural gas due to the war in Ukraine. Their nuclear fleet was almost entirely gone. And they knew that if they hit a moment in time where the wind was not blowing, um, they would be in uh, up a creek without a paddle. So they expanded their coal fleet drastically. Um, I'm sure you've seen headlines all around of these protests going on at the coal fired or at the, uh, uh, the coal mines that are uh, getting ready to displace yet another small town in Germany. Just an unbelievable, terrible, a, a, a sling of of terrible choices, one after the other. And now we're all watching it play out. It's, in it's finance, brilliant. Justin, in finance, I think we call this negative compounding. So it's the negative compounding of all these bad energy policies over the years, really, since 2008, 2009 and post Fukushima, where they decided they were going to, regardless, they were going to ignore the free market. They were going to ignore um, trying to lock in a long-term cheap electricity price, and they were going to keep focusing on their goal of clean energy rather than any type of diversification strategy, any type of backup plan. I mean, they you brought this up. They burned, they imported, uh, not everyone's aware of this, unless you're in Germany, they imported an insane amount of coal, an insane amount of wood, an insane amount of liquefied natural gas the last four, five, six months. They actually paid the Chinese over 100% markup price. The Chinese resold the liquefied natural gas and natural gas pipeline that was piped to them from the Russians. And then they put it back on tankers and resold it to Germans and other people in the European Union at unbelievably high prices back in August, September, and October. There are articles about this coming out on oilprice.com. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's the, that's the big story kind of, of what not to do. Belgium is sort of a head scratcher as well. Um, they, they closed down, uh, one reactor is about to close. They decided to close down, uh, what is the Doal 3 plant? And then a few months later, they decided to give life extensions to two of their reactors. I, apparently they uh, finally did some math on the back of a napkin, um, really doesn't take a, a lot of, uh, insight or, or mathematic abilities to, to understand, you just can't shut down these baseload reactors and and just be fine. You you need that electricity. I, if you intend to operate your society in the same manner going forward, of course. Um, so rather than uh, rather than continue to shut those down, they're extending two of their reactors after closing one uh, just a few months back. Uh, kind of a head scratcher. But on the positive side, some countries are actually seeing the light, and one of those countries is uh, is the country of Japan. Of course, Japan has the uh, most recent nuclear accident in most people's memory, which, as I've already mentioned, was Fukushima in 2011. Um, they also are the only country that's ever experienced, you know, the fallout of a, of a, of a nuclear warhead uh, being detonated, uh, too, of course, um, during World War II. And so the country now is in majority uh, in favor um, in public opinion polls of restarting nuclear power plants. So since 2011, um, so first of all, they had 54 reactors at the time of the Fukushima accident. Since 2011, they've restarted only 10 of those reactors, and they've gone through a very, very grueling process of um, making sure that they're checking all of their boxes in terms of uh, safety protocols and backups. And by the way, the world's fleet did this after Fukushima. That was a big wake-up call. 
Um, despite the fact that there were no deaths directly associated with this, it was still, uh, you know, not a good thing for this reactor to melt down or these multiple reactors to melt down. So a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, reactor operators had gut checks and shored up their safety protocols. So in Japan, they have a stringent protocol for, uh, for restarting these reactors that includes a number of checkpoints, which is essentially, you know, uh, the local, the local populace within a certain diameter around the actual operating plant has to be majority in favor of the restart. They have to go through all of the, um, uh, all of the, you know, the checklist, safety checklist, et cetera. And so 10 reactors have been restarted, but now the uh, new prime minister Kishida is very, very pro nuclear. And he was saying that he wants to have an additional six reactors restarted by this summer. That's probably not going to happen, but there are three reactors that are very close to restart. I think that those could be restarted in the next six months. One of those being a boiling water reactor, which will be the first boiling water reactor to be restarted. So hopefully that will set the stage for more of these uh, brilliant uh, marvels of engineering in the country of Japan to be restarted. Um, but that's a big story in terms of uranium goes for supply and demand, because not only do you have... Um, you know, Japan's still sitting on some inventory from the overhang of, of so many reactors being closed down that could come back into the market that is less likely to with more reactors restarted. But we actually are hearing, you know, the Japanese route in the market um, planning to be buying uranium soon. So uh, quite the swing for, for, for the country of Japan. And it makes so much sense for them. They're huge importers. I think they're actually one of the, the largest, if not the largest, importer of natural gas. Um, they import a lot of coal. And so nuclear, one of the other benefits, of course, is the concentration of the fuel unbelievably concentrated. And they can they can store decades worth of uh, of energy uh, within a warehouse uh, for a number of reactors. And so um, very pleased to see them uh, kind of turning, turning and uh, doing a 180 here and accelerating those restarts. And since we're a decade over decade now post Fukushima, we can kind of talk about why the uranium market stalled and went into a bear market besides just the the not in my backyard, the after effects of Fukushima as people were paying attention to the problems with their water and the radiation leaks. There were other reasons why nuclear power and uranium was in a bear market for so long. There were two major factors because I've covered this market for so long and you can um, chime in if you disagree. One of the major ones, you brought up Japan. Japan, the Japanese nuclear reactors were shutting down. They're phasing them out for a while. So the policy seems to potentially be reversing doing a 180 now. And so they were dumping a lot of their excess supply that they had stockpiled, their nuclear fuel rods, they were trying to resell it back onto the market. And then the other one was the world's largest and lowest cost uranium miner, Kazataprom in Kazakhstan. They actually kept, if you go on their website and look at a chart of their production and sales, they actually kept increasing while the uranium price was falling post Fukushima. They actually kept increasing their uranium uh, growth, their uh their production. And so they were selling more and more uranium at lower and lower prices. It was kind of like what the Saudis were doing decades ago, where they're flooding the market with super cheap uranium. And they were kind of basically destroying the market there and causing everyone a lower price that no one can make any money. Yeah, I think you pretty much nailed it. I mean, there's definitely some nuance there, but that was a big, a big element of it. Uh, so, so Japan, you know, when they shut off all their reactors, that was 10% of the world's demand that turned off overnight, essentially. Um, while at the same time, you know, it takes so much capital and so much time for producers to get into production. So we had this big, big run up in price from 04 to 07, and it sort of reset kind of to a higher low. Prior to Fukushima, we were re-entering sort of a bull market in some ways for the commodity and the sector when Fukushima happened. And um, that was a big shock to demand, right? A 10% cut in demand while uh, the production continued. And a lot of that production was tied into long-term contracts. Uh, but Japan, you know, they they uh, some of the utilities actually reneged on contracts following Fukushima. Um, they did have some inventory that came to the market. A lot of Japan's inventory was and still is held in uh, in EUP and fabricated fuel. So a lot of that doesn't really go into the market. But some of it was U three hundred eight. Sorry, I don't know how familiar your audience is with the fuel cycle, but I uh, just mined uranium. Yellow cake is U three hundred eight, and then converted uranium is called uh, uranium hexafluoride or UF six. And and some of that inventory is typically you know that's u- ubiquitous. So. Uh, that can be uh, enriched to whatever level utility needs and, and then fabricated into their their uh, fuel that will match their reactor design. But UF6 and U308 are ubiquitous. They can be sold in the spot market to whomever, by whomever. So there definitely was and still is. I mean, most, most uh, analysts in the sector will still model for a few million pounds a year coming from Japan, but I think that's even on the high side. Um, so we've worked through a lot of that. But to your point, um, Kazakhstan was a major, major producer, still is, of course, 
then yes, they continued to increase their production. I think their production peaked, if I recall correctly, in 2016, um, right at which happened to mark the low for the commodity. But at the time, you know, they were 100% state owned entity, largely influenced by Russia. And um, they had a massively depreciating currency, the the Kazakh Tenge. So they were, they had operating costs in that were that paid for in Tenge, and then they sold in US dollars into the into the world market. So hugely oversupplied market for quite a few years. Um, and of course, China was continuing to build out um, a number of reactors continue to build out. In fact, even with uh, Japan only having 10 reactors restarted, it was just a couple of years ago where we we again breached the all time high of uh, of reactor operating is in terms of terawatt hours produced um, just a couple of years back. So the nuclear fleet continued to grow ex Japan and ex uh, Germany globally, and now we're back uh, and you know moving into those all time high range and then growing every year two or three percent a year at this point. But yeah, Kazakhstan was a big one. Now um, because Adam Prom, the Kazakhstan operating company for uh, the uranium mining, is um uh 80 percent 75 percent or 80 percent i apologize I'm, I'm i'm forgetting at the moment they're um, publicly traded though right only they're on the, partially public yes okay on and the so london they, stock exchange or over the counter for americans or canadians who are listening yes yeah on the lsc uh kap is the ticker um phenomenal value play they produce an am- amazing amount of cash um they pay a dividend um obviously they're in a tricky jurisdiction here and so that's there's been some hair on that story especially over the last year but um, they they've they've reined it in a little bit. Of course, even Kazakhstan is not a bottomless pit of uranium. They even model out their own production peaking at about the end of the decade, which and then declining very quickly based on their proven out deposits and the potential for future mines. So um, but they still are the big player in the space. Yeah, I've interviewed Rick Roll a number of times about this, and he's also a uranium expert, much like yourself, although his timing was off. He was predicting uranium bull market years in advance, and he was wrong on the timing. But he knows as much about uranium and nuclear power almost as much as anyone out there because he's been covering it for decades now. And he was saying that the middle management that Kazakh, uh, Kazataprom in Kazakhstan has hired over the last like three, four, five years since they were flooding the market with cheap supply, they kind of looked at what the Saudis and OPEC were doing and saying that we have this business model wrong. We need to have less supply and we need to focus on a higher price. So the spot price, long-term contract price trends higher. We don't want to flood the market with cheap supply. We don't want to exhaust our reserves at cheaper and cheaper prices. So even though they would probably have a larger market share, they wouldn't be selling the uranium at the highest possible price. Totally. Yeah. And I mean, there's there's an overall profit incentive by being conservative in your production to encourage higher pricing. But there's also knowing that your deposits have have physical limits um, and how important this element is towards the future of electricity production, how important they are as a player to to Russia and to Europe and, and to some extent in North America as well. So um, I think that they're they're being very intelligent at this point. Management, you know, the C-suite has been a bit of a revolving door over the past few years. So that's kind of curious. Um, uh, they did actually announce in their in their uh, Q4 um, conference call today, in their in the, the Q4 uh, report that came out today, basically that they're they're guiding for lower production this year and potentially into 2024. They're having a supply chain problem still with um, sulfuric acid, which is the lixivium that they use in their uh, ISR mining production. So, um, you know, they're it's they're not infallible. Um, they have been very reliable, but you know, I've always said that. I'm not necessarily betting on Kazadam Prom, you know, faltering, but I am betting on the supply chain being very, very fragile with almost half of the world's production coming from this one country that's in a geopolitical tricky situation. Um, it's just ripe for disruption. And so, and that can happen really kind of at any time. So ISR for our listeners who are not familiar, that's in situ recovery. And that's a type of what evaporation technique similar to lithium mining. And so you're not using you're not you're not doing a ton of deep underground mining is it near surface and it's it's the lowest possible cost um uranium technique um not deep underground mining though right correct yeah it's not necessarily deep it really depends i mean depth is not a huge problem with isr necessarily but you have to have the right geology that will support um and that will support it so uh, you have to be able to well i mean in kazakhstan you don't necessarily have the environmental regulations that you would have in canada for example or in the united states but but yeah, it's a series of wells, injection and recovery wells. And so you inject um, a fluid that will that will bind with the mineral that you're intending to extract, which in this case is uranium and the extraction wells will pull it, pull that fluid through the ore body and, and it'll interact with the mineral and bind to the mineral. And you have this uh, impregnated then um, 
uh, solution that comes through that recovery well and that's process. It, it's a very, very low cost way of mining. And increasingly, I think that's the direction that that the world is going to the extent that a, you know, a certain deposit can actually uh, justify that type of mining. And there's there's very creative work being done around ISR. So for example, Denison Mines in Saskatchewan, Canada has a very high grade mine, their Phoenix deposit in uh, in the Athabasca Basin. And they have just recently in the past few months proven that they can ISR mine there. So they're actually using these uh, it's it's difficult to explain, but they're they're basically um, creating a ring around the deposit vertically using these freeze wells to keep the uh, the the lixivant and the impregnated solution from from seeping out past this particular area that they surround the deposit with. It's it's brilliant, and they've, it's, they've been it able to do it. sounds similar to like a heat bleaching pond with a pad. So so they keep like the chemicals um, contained within a certain amount of space. Right. Yeah, they they had they have to contain that exactly because but the geology isn't as such uh, similar to Kazakhstan in the Athabasca Basin. So they have to come up with some creative ways to to keep that fluid contained in basically an area where it's just an under, underground river throughout that entire basin. So uh, pretty brilliant what they've done. And it opens up, in my opinion, the potential for way, way uh, more deposits, not only in that area, but globally that that could be mined in this manner with a little bit of creativity. That's interesting that there's that type of innovation going on right now. And for our listeners who are not familiar, Denison is the Lundin family, the billionaire resource family back to uranium play. Correct. Yeah. So I want to ask you about uranium enrichment facilities, because I've heard people say that there's plenty of uranium supply. That's not really the issue. One of the major bottlenecks here in the U.S. is that the Department of Energy here in the U.S. will not approve enrichment facilities. So we can take that uranium that's mined and then turn it into usable products for nu- nuclear fuel rods for nuclear power plants. Do you think that we're going to actually get the Department of Energy to approve some of these in a uranium enrichment facilities so we don't have to go and import a lot of finished uranium products from Russia, because that's been uh, before. Uh, I, I think there were sanctions with the Russia-Ukraine war back uh, February or March. I think more was that stuff was put. There's a lot of people worried about that, and that caused the uranium spike. But do you think there's going to be any smart long-term solutions to actually approve uranium enrichment facilities here in the United States? I, it, it seems like they're moving in that direction. So a couple of signs that I think are positive is that uh, the the DOE has actually awarded um, two two uh, uh, excuse me two SMR projects, small modular reactor uh, demonstration projects. So one is Terra Power's Natrium Reactor, and another one is X Energy's XC100. Um, and both of these reactor designs utilize what's called HALU, high assay, low enriched uranium. Um, now we do have enrichment in the United States; it's just owned by uh, by the UK. So Uranco, uh, that's owned by uh, by England, has um has a facility in new mexico in the states and then we also have centris uh which centris doesn't but, actually but isn't ahead. so uranco don't they have all these permits for enormous expansion and they keep getting denied and wasn't the u.s prior to the uh, russia invading ukraine what in february wasn't the u.s importing like about 80 75 80 percent of all their enriched uranium from russia uh no because we in the u.s there's there's something called the russian suspension agreement that actually limits uh russian imports um to about 20 percent um, without getting into the weeds of that. So so it's it's vital. It's been vital to the West. It's been vital to Canada. It's been vital to uh, EU. But um, but it still has limits within the Russian suspension agreement. Interestingly enough, there are a supposedly a couple of utilities in the United States which are pushing back against this RSA to try to encourage to be able to buy more from Russia, <laughs> despite <laughs> the fact that, yeah, it's, it's insane. Um, so, uh, so going back to enrichment, Urenko, uh, Urenko announced in the autumn of last year that they are going to um, fire back up their centrifuge production facility. I do believe they they are permitted to build more, but they're not jumping into doing so until they have um, long term contracts sufficient in place because it's very very expensive. Um, so there's about let's see. In the West, there's 27, roughly 27 million SWU. That's separate of work unit. That's the total available, let's say, capacity for enrichment. Um, and it's about a billion and a half dollars US to expand 1 million SWU. So for significant enrichment um, expansion in the West, it's going to be very expensive and, t- and uh, time. Uh, uh, it's going oh, to yeah. Take a long, Just long permitting time, so. and regulatory approval, you're looking at tens of millions of dollars and a long time frame. 
Yes. Yes. So, but what, what is going on is, is the U S uh, government and the DOE in particular seem to be very uh, supportive of small modular reactors in this quote unquote advanced nuclear. So a number of these designs that are, that are getting a lot of uh, uh, positive feedback from the government. And so <clears throat> these two designs that I mentioned are part of this uh, demonstration project where um, they are working on building the first plant. So uh, Terra powers natrium is going to be built in Wyoming um, X Energy XE100 is going to build in Washington, and uh, there's a lot of funding coming from the from the DOE for this. Um, I believe, if I recall correctly, it was something like 1.3 billion for these demonstration projects. Um, and so, part of that is because these reactors are set to run on this high assay, low enriched uranium, and we don't currently have a HALU circuit in the United States. That they are uh, they are uh, awarding a contract for Centris to be able to establish that circuit. And so they're encouraging some uh, expansion of enrichment in the United States. And then, of course, uh, we're, we're waiting to see if, in fact, we will uh, accept um, Silex's uh, global laser enrichment facility to be built in Paducah and actually start uh, laser enrichment in the United States. I believe that it probably will happen. There's definitely still some risk around it because there's concerns of proliferation with that technology getting out into the wrong hands. But um, we'll see how that goes. So there, they, all signs are pointing in that direction. With all of that said, I never hold my breath with uh, with government policy because it can, even if it's moving that direction, it can take forever. Yeah, and they could do a 180 depending upon Congress or a white election in the White House. So two years from now, the policy could be entirely different. Whichever administration comes in in place could have a different view of what energy needs to be invested in. And then the current plan could be totally wiped out or phased out or or blocked or they defund it. There's a bunch of different things. Unfortunately, we were talking before I start recording. I've had firsthand experience with uh, whistleblowers, the Department of Energy, people who retired who quit out of frustration or were bullied over the corruption and stuff and was spoke out to me and told me like all the stories. You talked about small modular reactors, but one technology that's not there that I think is potentially the best that the United States is not willing, uh, the US government, at least the Department of Energy is not willing to approve a pilot plant anymore is a liquid fluoride molten salt thorium reactor because it would recycle old nuclear weapons. It would recycle these old wasted nuclear fuel rods so we wouldn't have to store them for thousands of years. Uh, I would like to see investment there, but it looks like it's gonna be in other countries. Yeah, I think if I recall correctly, uh, China is working on building a, uh, a a molten salt thorium reactor. And so um, definitely going to happen in other countries before it happens here in the States. Um, that's one technology. It's very exciting. It's going to probably be quite a while until that's potentially embraced on a larger scale. But uh, thorium can be used, utilized in uh, heavy water reactors currently with a little bit with a mix of just like a sprinkling of halo. That's something I think is really interesting. That was shared with me by a, a nuclear en engineer recently. So um, hopefully we'll we'll kind of move in that direction. So I think that thorium has some promise, but um, the for the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the United States, they they tend to take a very 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 long time to approve anything that isn't already um, understood and approved. So especially with how there's been such a big gap in new nuclear builds in the United States, and so the the, you know, the Vodal plant in um, in Georgia is, is still kind of crawling towards a eventual start eventual grid connection. Um, possibly, I believe that's supposed to happen later this year, if not 2024. So knock on wood, that'll happen soon. And then of course, you know, a lot of promise going forward with SMRs, but uh, these processes always take time with new with new uh, technologies. Well, it's really sad because the liquid fluoride molten salt thorium reactor was invented by Alvin Weinberg, what in the 30s or 40s. And then they had the test pilot plan, I think in the 60s, it ran for a couple of years in, at the Tennessee Valley Authority. So we have all the intellectual property, but then Instead of allowing investment in more testing, research, and development, and funding, I think that they just gave away the intellectual property to the Chinese for free. So it seems like a lot of the people, the scientists, and the politicians and bureaucrats, the Department of Energy, or the political appointees there, they seem to be anti uh, liquid fluoride molten salt thorium reactor. And then we just gave away the intellectual property to develop it to the Chinese for free. Yeah, I mean, we'll see how that goes with the one that the China is building, and and see if they uh, embrace that te technology and build more after that first sort of test reactor is built. So uh, perhaps they're they're looking at that. But there's so many exciting designs that um, are so much more efficient uh, in terms of uranium utilization and um, with with higher enriched uranium and potentially with uh, with some thorium as well. So I think there's still promise in the states and and uh, and elsewhere for for new technologies on that front. So I want to ask you about costs for uranium mining. So 
are they dealing with the same cost increases that these uh, low grade open pit miners like copper miners, uh, bear gold, or some of these larger copper miners that have gold as a byproduct? They, they, excuse me, are they dealing with high diesel costs, electricity costs, labor costs going up, uh, just like other mining industries the last two, two and a half years? Yeah, it's uh, we've had um, definitely seen some some capex adjustments for these feasibility studies that have come out for some of the developers and some of the uh, miners that are looking to restart projects that have been um, idled on care and maintenance. So to give you one example, Paladin, who operates the Langer Heinrich uranium mine in Namibia, they had a uh, a capitalization est uh, uh, estimate for restarting this mine that they had put out. Uh, let's see, this was in November of 2021, that it was, I believe it was 87 million was the estimated capex to restart the mine. And within six or seven months, they had to update that to 117 million. Um, so it's, you know, inflation is, is affecting everybody, uh, including the miners. And we've seen, for example, you know, the estimated marginal cost for the projects that are uh, the higher cost projects. So we're talking about projects that have lower grade deposits, a much higher capex to get into production um, that are, are further down the road, right? When we get into more of a crunch with supply and demand, if you go out towards the end of the decade, basically every uh, proposed project is going to need to be developed to close the supply gap, as, at least according to our own modeling work. Um, but, you know, you would estimate that we'd see, you know, maybe 60, $65 for these projects on the margin to even start to begin to think about moving towards production, let alone investigating cost of capital and, and securing contracts and things like that. That now, uh, according to Dustin Garrow, who's a, a colleague um, who's been in the markets forever, uh, he he basically thinks, thinks the marginal cost of production is north of $90 a pound. And so we're, we're sitting here at 50 bucks a pound because Adam Prom is making money, Cameco is making money, and pretty much everybody else is uh, signing contracts at higher prices if they're thinking about developing mines or um, getting things into, uh, you know, care and maintenance mines coming into production. So the price needs to go much, much higher. And, you know, there's only so much uranium that can be contracted in the high 50s, low 60s, which is basically where we're seeing contracts being signed right now. Um, that's a certain block of supply. When that's gone, we're going to see a big jump up into the next tier. And that next tier could be much, much higher, especially if we push that out a year or two and, and, and we see more inflation uh, going forward. So uh, we're certainly, I mean, honestly, I think it's it's a practical guarantee that we get up into the uh, 70s or 80s and possibly even higher. Then, of course, we have this other thing, which is the potential for financialization of the sector that could take us north of 100 and beyond. Um, gun to my head, it probably happens, but that's not really what we bet on. We, we we bet on the supply and demand fundamentals for the sector. Yeah, I think costs are rising, like you said. I think there's going to be higher price floors. I think we're going to be looking in the next two or three years for sure at 70 to $75 per pound for a lot of these uh, miners to bring new supply online that are not a Cameco, that are not a Kazataprom because of the cost of capital and all these costs rising. There's just going to have to be a much higher incentive for the price to stay at a higher price floor for new supply to come online because those are the basically the two low cost producers. What do you have the cost at? I'm curious for Kazataprom because uh, pretty much everyone says they're the lowest cost producer. So I know their costs are up. Are they still producing at $30, $40 a pound? Um, I think they're still in that range. I think that if you were to um, if you were to do a fully allocated, so if you actually consider the cost of their dividend and all costs involved in producing, they're probably pushing into the high 30s at this point, if not low 40s. So they're they're still making money here. But if you just look at their cash costs, you're not taking in everything into account. But they're definitely seeing higher prices, especially for their uh, you know, labor and their lixivian, which is sulfuric acid, including, you know, a bit of supply chain problems on that delivery. So um, their costs have gone higher, um, their prices have gone higher. And I don't think they're in any hurry. Honestly, the guidance that they gave out today of, of a few million pounds less uh, for 2023 and potentially 2024 is a pretty big deal for them to be in, in, in a sector that's producing, let's say this year, 135, maybe, maybe 140 million pounds of uranium. For you know, four or five million pounds less, that's pretty significant. So you brought up financialization of uranium. 
Uh, one of the main things, some people are for it and some people are against it. I think it's good for the retail investor because they can get a uranium pure play. And also it's not just futures contracts. There's allocated storage of physical uranium is a Sprott physical uranium trust. And I think they just released in the last like six or seven months, uh, Sprott uranium miners ETF. So these are, I think these are all good things long-term for retail investors and institutional investors, because then they can get some allocation to physical uranium that's actually allocated. They're not playing games with the prospectus like a GLD or an SLV, you actually know the uranium's there and it's secure in a vault and they're not just going to dump it back on the market or it's not like they do an audit and there's uh, no uranium there. Yeah, exactly. This, um, the Spraw Physical Uranium Trust has been quite the the boon to the sector. Um, you know, they took over Uranium Participation Corporation that was established back in 2005 and from 2005 to uh, 2021, they purchased 18 million pounds of uranium. Sprott took it over and has since purchased over 40 million pounds of uranium in less than two years. Um, they had an ATM that went live in the summer of 2021. So this is an at-the-market financing vehicle where basically when the trust is trading uh, at a premium to their net asset value or the closing nav of the previous day, they are allowed to issue shares into the open market and raise cash and buy uranium with that, with that cash. And so... Um, you know, the risk off markets over the past year ish is in the past nine months or so has definitely affected their ability to raise capital, but they, um, they were in the market, you know, three or four out of the last five days, uh, including today. So we'll see how much they raise. I think they probably raised, uh, between 20 and $30 million today alone. Um, that's a vehicle that is very interesting because it also is owned by the ETF. So we kind of have this concept we call the flywheel effect where we have capital that flows into the ETFs and into the Sprott vehicle that, so the ETFs then buy the Sprott vehicle and the Sprott vehicle then buys uranium. And that purchasing of uranium is accretive on the price. And that tends to move the whole sector. The Sprott vehicle also is about 80% owned by institutions. So when you look, when you actually chart this, this uh, Sprott physical uranium trust, you want to look for volume into that because that's showing you institutional interest uh, essentially, as well into Cameco and to some extent the ETFs, although the ETFs are actually majority owned by retail, uh, interestingly enough, even though they are the more liquid. But the Sput vehicle, uh, the Cameco, some of the larger uh, players like NextGen and Denison, you know, there's only so many stocks that very large players can buy. So you want to watch those for volumes to see institutional interest. And, and you know, you know, typically when financial players, you know, get kind of the taste of blood, uh, they tend to be somewhat aggressive and I don't think we're quite there, but I, I honestly think the potential for a spiking in price is definitely there. And there's not a lot of uranium coming into the spot market. It's not like it's the status bucket. And once it's gone, it's gone. There is production that is sold into the spot market on an ongoing basis, but it's not that much, you know, it's, you know, a couple million pounds a month, maybe. And so, you know, it's not going to take a lot of money flowing into this sector to really, really move things in a big way. And that's something I believe we're going to see. And this, uh, uh, the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, they're not day trading uranium, right? So they're not, if they, they think the uranium price is high, they're not dumping the market with a bunch of supply. They only tend to really uh, accumulate and stockpile supply. They, so, the, so according to their prospectus, they are only buyers of uranium. Um, we've spoken to John Chapaglia, the CEO of Sprott many, many times. Um, he always says we, we do not intend to sell uranium. Um, in my personal opinion, is it possible in the future that they could sell it? I think that it is possible. I don't know. Uh, according to what they are telling us, that is not in their plans whatsoever. Of course, that would have a pretty significant reversing effect on the sector as a whole and would not be great for their shareholders. So um, when they trade, and they have traded at big discounts in the net asset value. So the way that Uranium Participation Corporation would operate, and they didn't do this very many times uh, over their over their tenure, but um, when they traded at a significant discount to their net asset value, they'd actually sell some of the uranium and buyback shares and try to close that discount. The Sprott Trust has now traded at a discount as extreme as 18%. I mean, they didn't stay there for that long, but basically they're just like, hey, we we believe in the long term of this vehicle. We believe in the long term of this sector. It's best for shareholders for us to not sell the uranium that we hold. So when we're at a discount to NAV, that's your opportunity to buy uranium cheaper than you can on the spot market, essentially, is what you're doing. And so- yeah, uh, there's a chart for our listeners not familiar. There's actually a chart on the Sprout Physical Uranium website and the discount to NAV or the premium to NAV. If you look at the chart over the last couple of years since the uh, Sprout Physical Uranium Trust was created, it's literally all over the place. <laughs> 
Totally. Yeah, it, it is all over the place. I mean, they were at a, a 100% discount, not 100% discount. They were at a discount 100% of the oh, time. Oh, I would like it if it was 100%. Of- <laughs> <laughs> free uranium. It's a free call yeah. option then. Yeah. <laughs> for the entire month of December, uh, or 100% of the month, that's what I meant to say, they were at a discount to their net asset value. And so they they didn't raise a single penny. They didn't buy a single pound of uranium. But you know, they're just like, hey, we're here. This is how we operate. And to the extent that money flows into the vehicle, we're going to do what we do. Um, so yeah, we basically, you know, people, <laughs> uranium folks uh, on Twitter just call it that it's more pounds went to uranium heaven because we basically aren't considering those pounds ever to be sold. If they do ever sell it, that's going to be at a point where ideally as an investor, you're probably already out of the market. So it's not one of those things that we concern ourselves with. And we, you know, we essentially trust what we're being told by the operators of that vehicle. Do you expect then in the next like two or three years for mergers and acquisitions to occur, say a Cameco or a medium sized player to start buying up some of the quality uranium assets in the Athabasca Basin in Canada? Because Cameco already has one large mine there, what it's either MacArthur River or Cigar Lake or both. I know both are in Canada. I can't remember which one's in the Athabasca Basin, but it would make more sense to go and buy the assets cheaply before the bull market really starts ripping again. Yeah. You know, we were thinking along those lines uh, a few years ago, honestly, they they were trading at such a premium to the valuation of NextGen, who is the owner of the Aero deposit, which is um, pretty much the highest grade, largest deposit of basically any metal. Um, it's It's an absolute behemoth and uh but they they uh they didn't make a bid for them and that actually surprised a lot of people i think part of the reason why is they still see a lot of upside potential in both cigar lake and macarthur river but i also think that um they 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 have a decent amount of wealth of exploration projects and development projects also in the athabasca basin they basically own the best assets in the united states um, will we see them uh, sell those non-core assets going forward? I'm not sure. I think that's possible. They also have a mine, a joint venture in Kazakhstan, the Inkai mine. That's a, a pretty a fantastic deposit as well. So they did just acquire 49% interest. Now it hasn't fully closed, officially closed, but uh, it's pretty much going to. Um, a 49% interest in Westinghouse. And Westinghouse is a, a major player in uh, nuclear power plant builds and uh, a builder of componentry for nuclear power plants, as well as a service provider. So uh, they make fabricated fuel and they also um, own the Springfields conversion plant in the UK, which is currently idled. Um, I believe that they are looking into the potential of restarting that conversion plant, which would actually be a very good thing for the fuel cycle. Conversion is kind of a pinch point here in the West currently. But um, I'm, I don't really know if Cameco is going to go on the shopping spree for um, deposits. We have seen and probably will see further consolidation around the sector going forward. So we've seen a decent amount of M&A over the past 24 months. And I think we'll, we'll likely see more of that happening going forward as well. Yeah, I want to comment on the Westinghouse deal because it's actually, I think they have a Cameco as a partner and it's an infrastructure company. So it's around a 50-50 joint venture deal with an infrastructure company. And the infrastructure company is going to be handling some of the management with the supply chain for the nuclear power. Westinghouse, for those not familiar, they're a big name in nuclear power plant construction and a lot of the parts that go into a nuclear power plant. Westinghouse has a lot of patents on those. So on paper, this deal looks like Cameco is vertically integrating into nuclear power plants, more nuclear power plants being built and that's going to be one of their growth drivers. So they're diversifying away from just uranium mining and uranium supply. But when a mining company tends to, the past track record of mining companies tending to try to vertically integrate does not always work out so well. So we'll have to see if that works out well for Cameco. Cameco, But they're not doing this acquisition by themselves. They have an infrastructure partner that's supposed to help with a lot of the logistics and running the Westinghouse business and the infrastructure business with the nuclear power plants and the parts and the um, servicing. For sure. Yeah, it's definitely a, a, a vertical integration. You know, the guys from Cameco, they're always uh, talking about how um, how much how bullish they are in the future of nuclear power. Um, and so I think this is a this is a big planting of their flag in, in that direction. Um, it'll be really interesting to see. I mean, honestly, we're all kind of dying to see some of the um, some of the implications for cash flow and revenues coming from current operations from Westinghouse. So, and, and you, and when you listen to Cameco's CFO Grant Isaac talk, you can hear he's he's almost giddy just with uh, being able to to discuss these things once the once the deal goes through. But one interesting market, for example, is these uh, VVER Russian design reactors in Eastern Europe. Now, there's 34 of these currently. 
that historically have been purchasing not only their uh, fabricated fuel. So they have a unique uh, design shape of their fuel rods. I believe it's a hexagonal shape of the fuel rod. And um, Westinghouse can make this fuel rod. And But historically, you know, uh, most of these Eastern European VVR operators would source that fuel from Russia. Uh, probably it was cheaper and faster, right? But now, uh, because of the war in Ukraine and uh, most of the reactors that are in the quote-unquote West, uh, reactor operators, I should say, have been um, voluntarily self-sanctioning by not m- doing any new future business with Russia. A lot of these operators have continued to receive deliveries from Russia from legacy contracts, but they haven't been engaging in new contracts. Okay, and so uh, this is these are 34 reactors now that are likely to not only buy their fuel rods going forward um, from Westinghouse, but they're likely to look to Cameco for the U308 and their conversion. And uh, the only thing that Cameco or Westinghouse doesn't have at this point is enrichment. Of course, Cameco owns a minority share in GLE and Global Laser Enrichment, but. Um, we'll, we'll see how that goes going forward in terms of them expanding into enrichment further, but yeah, full, full on vertical integration. And, uh, we're excited to kind of hear more about, uh, the cash flow potential from this acquisition. Yeah. So on paper, the deal actually looks good for potential growth. It's a big bet on nuclear power, vertical integration. So they're diversifying away from just uranium mining. They're going to have more cash flows from actual nuclear power plants building out, but we'll have to see if they can actually execute the business plan and run the rest of these businesses efficiently. So it sounds like they do have a partner on board who can help them with this rather than if they were just a miner trying to get into a business they don't understand. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. Good point. Yeah. So it'll probably take a couple of years to see if they actually produce the results that they're seeing. But um, on paper, it does. I, I am cautiously optimistic about things. Agreed. So I want to ask you as we wrap up here about the Oliver Stone nuclear power documentary Davos. It seems that the Davos crowd, actually, there was a overwhelming demand to go watch this documentary because he was talking about the benefits long-term in nuclear power compared to a lot of other power options. And some of the people are actually more open to it than in the past. It's really interesting, uh, Jason. There's, There's been quite a shift in sentiment around nuclear, just to speak generally. Uh, especially amongst the environmental left, let's say, uh, in the political spectrum. Um, you know, we had, for example, in the United States, the uh, the Green New Deal that was proposed a number of years back that basically was, you know, had statements within it that were, that were saying, you know, looking at cataclysmic disaster for the world within a 10-year time frame because of carbon emissions, yet no nuclear, in fact, planning on phasing out nuclear ASAP. Um, they came under huge fire for the for that statement. And since, since then, we actually see majority bipartisan support from both the Democrats and the Republicans for nuclear, um, especially when it comes to life extension. So, in, so we've had this recent Inflation Reduction Act um, that was put into, into uh, legislation that has uh, abundant uh, operational uh, tax credits as well as invest in, in, excuse me, production tax credits and investment tax credits for clean energy and nuclear qualifies for that. So this is definitely helping these uh, demonstration projects for these SMRs. And it's a huge boon for the actual operators of nuclear power plants, especially those that were kind of on the knife's edge of profitability. So um, very, very pleased to see that. And of course, you know, we just saw the... Um, the, the, the COP27 that, that recently happened and that um, for the first time ever at a COP conference, nuclear had a seat at the table. There were actually uh, a boost for, for nuclear there. And then, of course, um, Oliver Stone's uh, new film called Nuclear, which first aired, I believe it was last fall. I believe it was the Venice um, uh, Film Festival. They showed that at Davos. And from what I heard, it was standing room only and uh, was very, very well accepted for that crowd. So it's a huge shift in sentiment. And, you know, it's it's an obvious, obvious solution, especially for those that are kind of in a panic around around climate and, and carbon uh, emissions. And so we have entities such as the IEA, the International Energy Agency, who has a carbon um, uh, a net zero goal of 2050. And basically, they're saying that nuclear has to double globally by 2040. Uh, I don't even know how that can be accomplished. But that's that's the kind of language that we're seeing coming out of the um, very, very environmentally concerned sort of left. And, uh, you know, I'm very, very happy to see it that log- logic is sometimes actually prevailing. Um, so very excited to see that film as well. 
Well, also from a financial standpoint, nuclear power makes a lot of sense for a, for a long-term investment because you're getting much cheaper cost baseload electricity generation. You don't have all the variable cost spikes necessarily from coal and liquefied natural gas. I mean, look at the amount of uh, price increases there was on liquefied natural gas into the United Kingdom, into Germany and the rest of the European Union as they were phasing out or shutting down their nuclear power plants and the spikes in the other energy costs. I mean, you can lock in a long-term contract price on nuclear power and it makes a lot of sense, like I said, from a financial standpoint, because you look at Germany, I think at one point you said $500 billion. That's a large chunk of their GDP that they were not planning on spending on importing energy. So when you're importing more energy like a China, a Germany, Japan, your manufacturing powerhouse, your manufacturers can't compete. Instead of running enormous trade surpluses, your input costs, your um, import prices for energy are blowing through the are spiking enormously, running through the roof. You have tens of billions or hundreds of billions in extra expenses at the country level that you didn't plan on. And you could have avoided this with long-term investments into nuclear power. You didn't have to pay for those expensive energy inputs. And then um, your manufacturers can compete with cheap electricity costs. I, I couldn't have said it better myself. Um, it, it, yeah, it's in the countries surrounding Germany. Some of those are operating on a, a lot of nuclear energy and France has run into some problems over the past you know 12 to 18 months largely due to the insufficient maintenance that was put into their nuclear fleet over the previous decade because of their plan to phase nuclear back down um of course they reverse course on that plan and are actually looking at expanding nuclear but France is about 70% nuclear they are the largest electricity exporter in the world and um and they support the energy needs of all of their neighbors and so, uh, so for for Germany to be shutting down nuclear and then be buying energy from nuclear producing countries is is unbelievably hypocritical, and they could be in a very very different place in terms of of their the strength of their industry. It's a vitally important country. It's I believe it's the largest GDP in all of Europe. Um, and so it's it's becoming more and more clear that the countries that have embraced nuclear in the past are in a better position now, uh, not only for cost of electricity and stability of their grids but actual national security and so you know it's 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 interesting because it's you can look at this in two ways you can look at it from like from my perspective i'm in a major supporter of nuclear energy and you can probably tell but i'm also actually from an investing stand standpoint you have to look at not not what i believe should happen but what is happening and what is happening is there's a large re-embracing of nuclear happening right now. And there's huge, huge fundamental shifts within the nuclear fuel cycle, within life extensions for reactors that are happening under our feet right now. And it's it's super exciting time um, to be watching the sector and be invested in it. And a lot of people at, at in their economy also care about jobs. So if you're a manufacturer and all of a sudden your energy costs are spiking, you don't have cheap electricity anymore, you don't have cheap... Uh, cost for natural gas and diesel and oil for chemicals or plastics or things like that, all your input costs, you're going to move your factory. We're seeing this in Germany with large soap companies that just went bankrupt, which uses a lot of petrochemical products. And then also with BASF, the one of the world's largest chemical companies, I believe they're moving their main manufacturing to China because some type of subsidy or deal or something like that. But that's because of lack of cheap electricity and lack of cheap input costs. That means loss of jobs in that country. So uh, if a country could make sure that they have locked in cheap electricity costs, then the other inputs, if they are rising, at least the 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 factory owner, the the company would figure out then that uh, they could keep the factories there and keep the jobs, and that keeps the people happy and the and the economy um, at least like a little bit better than it should than it would be if there was um you know lack of cheap electricity. Yeah, very well said. Yeah, you nailed it with BASF. And I think within a couple of weeks of that announcement, Volkswagen even said that they were considering moving out of Germany. I mean, if that doesn't tell you. Yeah, it's a, it's, a disaster, it, it's a policy blunder. <laughs> I think they're on their third. I, I think I just saw the article this week that they're on their third floating LNG import facility. So they don't have the pipelines other than the Nord Stream one. So that was too reliant on Russia. They didn't have any diversification there and they didn't have the liquefied natural gas import facilities built out and then they didn't have um, the nuclear power plants um, that were ready to go. So what they've been burning a, while they taught their politicians still talk about that ESG and, and green energy. I mean, they've imported an insane amount of coal and they're burning it for the winter. hundred percent. Yeah. And they're burning lignite coal, which is the dirtiest coal. I mean, they have the dirtiest energy grid in the, in all of the EU with an exception of Poland, um, which is the majority coal. Now Poland actually is planning to build new nuclear. They actually signed a deal with Westinghouse. 
um, to build, I think it's three uh, AP 1000s, if I recall correctly. So good to see their neighbors um, looking to phase out coal and move into nuclear. And I mean, I think just the, the basic point here is I believe that the countries that embrace low, uh, or excuse me, that embrace high energy return on energy invested, high EROI sources of electricity are going to be the countries that are going to be prosperous and rich going forward into the future. And those that continue to um, to have majority grids of intermittent renewables with very low energy return on energy invested are going to have similar results as Germany. Yeah, I agree. And you can have an economy, a growing economy, a digital economy with more people working from home or on the internet using electronic devices. You can't have that without cheap electricity. So if you see electricity prices going bonkers, like in the European Union, where it's up $1,000 a month, you know, people got an unplanned bill, small business owners, it was even worse than that of electricity spikes for their input costs. And consumers got hit with insane increases in electricity bills. I mean, that's going to absolutely destroy the economy. It's it's interesting, Jason, because I, I think about this a lot. Um, you know, I don't know what happened to the conversation about energy efficiency. Um, I mean, I think that there's still some conversation around that in terms of like, like I mentioned, the Green New Deal had some element of that, uh, that was encouraging buildings to retrofit to be more energy efficient. I live in California. Um, there's obviously a lot of uh, uh, legal, uh, structural things that need to happen in terms of energy efficiencies here. But Oh, your utilities are a mess. You have all yeah. the fires and the wires coming down. It's a mess. Yeah, yeah. But where is the conversation about about electricity and energy efficiency? I mean, it's it's off the table. All we're talking about is electrifying freaking everything. And you can't do that unless you expand electricity generating sources that have a very high return on investment in terms of their electricity production. You just can't do it. So I'm all for energy conservation. Honestly, I would love to have that conversation. Nobody wants to have that conversation. It's all about electric cars, electric stoves, electric heat, electric freaking everything. Solar panels too. I mean, California has put in a lot of solar panels and even in California where they, you'd think that they would have some of the best solar in the world. That's not even running efficiently. Well, we have, you know, California is, is better than Germany. I mean, I think it's... <laughs> That's not saying much, though. <laughs> it, yeah, it's in the mid to high 20th percentile in terms of their capacity factor. Um, but of course, you have to have that buffered. You, you've got to have that backed up. And the, they're, they're expanding batteries as fast as they possibly can. But of course, batteries are a net energy sink. Um, they decay over time. They have to be replaced. They're a huge... They're expensive. So do the solar panels, man. The so exactly. People don't factor this in. I mean, the solar panels are using enormous amounts of rare earths, copper, silver, plastics, petroleum products to make the solar panel. And then the solar panel, maybe it lasts 10 years or 15 years, and then you have to replace it and it's expensive. Yeah. Yeah. And some of them will last a bit longer than that, but still, even with a 20 plus year life for solar panels, if you compare that, um, and most of the, most of the cost comparisons that you'll see out there are based on something called LCOE, levelized cost of energy. Uh, or electricity. And that doesn't take into account um, lifespan. It doesn't take into account uh, whether that source is buffered or not. So, so, you, you so might... it, sound, it sounds like a number cruncher that hasn't actually run a business. <laughs> they came up, came up, they told them what they wanted the, the numbers to look like. And the PhD economist just made the numbers or a statistician just made the numbers with an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. It's basically looking, it's comparing solar to other elements of electricity production when the sun is actually shining and, and there's and there's electricity running through the wires. It's not looking at the all-in uh, cost for that production. And California is interesting. I mean, to their uh to to their benefit, they at least decided to keep Diablo Canyon online. That was against all odds. I'm very surprised and very pleased that they're at least extending that to 2030. So we'll see how it goes beyond that. But, you know, this state has more electric cars than any other state in the country. And I think as of now, it's it's still less than a 5% penetration in terms of all the cars on the road in California. Yet, uh, in the height of the summer, when people are running their air conditioners in the afternoon, the, the state is asking people to not charge their electric vehicles. Um, so I, I don't know. Oh, also, no more new uh, internal combustion engine vehicles are uh, allowed to be sold in California after 2030. Yeah, so I, I grew don't up really in know California. what their plan is. <laughs> but bad policy, bad policy, bad policy um, on energy. They're, they're bad policies across. I grew up in Southern California. I lived there for 16 years and I moved. I haven't been back there in 20 years, but the, the I have friends who still live there. The policies are just atrocious. 
it's it's pretty embarrassing, but I have to give them credit for extending Diablo. I think that they had to, and I think um, Gavin Newsom, the governor here, recognized that uh, somebody within their cabinet kind of actually did some math. And so I think that rolling blackouts would have been worse for his constituency than actually keeping the plant online. Not that all of a sudden, you know, the 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 supermajority Democrat California is all of a sudden supportive of nuclear, but we've got to see something happen here because solar is not going to cut it for um, a state that's going to cut off new uh, new ICE vehicles after 2030. It's I'm not really sure what their plan is, but we'll have to see how it plays out. Well, Justin, I've kept you for over 50 minutes. I really enjoyed our discussion today. We'll have to have you back on. I could talk for a good hour uh, every couple months about nuclear power and uranium. I think it's really interesting. I also think it's a future of cheap electricity if the politicians and the bureaucrats would actually look at math and understand long-term investment. Absolutely. Yeah, it's been a pleasure speaking with you, Jason. Thank you so much for having me on, and I'm happy to come back anytime. And if our listeners want to check out Uranium Insider, how do they do so? Uh, We can be found at uraniuminsider.com. I'm also uh, pretty active on Twitter at Uranium Insider and pretty accessible there. If anybody wants to to tweet at me or or shoot me a direct message, also can email us through our website as well if you have any questions about our service or, or about nuclear in general.